it's really exciting to be here. Thank you very much to Expo Citizens for inviting me along. My name is Tim Sampi, and I'm the Chief Executive of a peer-led charity called Build on Belief. Don't worry if you haven't heard of it, we only operate in London, although we've been around in one form or another for 16 years. I hope over the next 20 minutes or so to entertain you with some thinking around how you build a peer-led charity, how you run a peer-led charity, and some of the things we've learned along the way. Before I go any further, I want to talk quickly about the PowerPoint you can see. I don't want to spend ages telling you what we do or how we think, so I thought I would show you. You'll get the idea. The pictures will show you build on belief. There's a few stats chucked in there, and the quotes will give you a taste of our spirit, our philosophy, if you like. What do I mean by peer-led? This charity was thought up, designed, implemented, and run by people with lived experience of addiction. With one exception, every single one of the 23 paid staff volunteered for us first. All have experiences, either of battles with their own substance use or adverse life experiences, prison, teenage pregnancy, violence, abuse. The sadly normal things for people like us. A bit about me, I am a man who is living his life backwards. I effectively retired from society when I was around the age of 19, the time I developed my addiction to heroin. I remained physically addicted to opiates every day between then and the age of 43, when for the first and only time I went into treatment. I did the whole detox, rehab, aftercare thing. I went online for the first time in 2004, used a mobile phone for the first time in 2005, I got my first proper job in 20 years when I was 44 in 2006 as a part-time service user coordinator for Kensington and Chelsea. I went to my first foreign holiday when I was 45, Portugal if you're interested. I learned to drive legally and passed my driving test when I was 47. I had my first and only child at the age of 51 and two weeks later became the chief executive of Bob when we incorporated the charity. Now, at the age of 60, I'm living the life I should have lived in my 20s. It's all back to front. My life story in a nutshell, I guess. I could never do anything the easy way. So what do we do? Our core business is running seven weekend peer-led, socially-based drop-in services that provide support and befriending activities. We don't do any therapeutic work. There's a whole treatment system out there for that. Instead, we provide a safe social space, something to eat and drink, and loads and loads of stuff to do. Music and art workshops, yoga and tai chi classes, mindfulness groups and cookery clubs, recovery chairs and gardening projects. As you can imagine, COVID-19 put a big spoke into that wheel, so we moved the activities online, and now provide 45 online activities over seven days a week keeping our weekend services running as old fashioned drop-ins, in many cases with food banks attached. The interesting part of this is that we use the premises of the main treatment providers in the boroughs where we work, utilizing the space when they're closed. So we have no overheads when it comes to premises and on costs like gas and electricity. In 2017, 2,588 individuals in London access these services more than 33,000 times. So we know that what we do works. So why do we do this? I think one of the inevitable and defining consequences of addiction is social isolation. First, you lose your job, assuming of course that you had one, then you lose your friends, and finally you lose your family. And all that is left is you and your substance use. Doctor treatment is designed to identify the cause of your problem and work out the changes you need to make in your day-to-day -day life make things better. Added to that is William White's noted academic statement that a treatment journey is two years long. That is from the moment you first decided to deal with your problems to the time when you're ready to toddle off into the wider world. Just being in treatment doesn't fill two years worth of time. I and my friends thought there was something missing from the treatment system back in the day when we were clients. That's not to criticize the providers. I'm very grateful for the support I received. But everything ran nine to five, Monday to Friday, and my life and my recovery didn't. 
I hated the weekends. I was unemployed, so I had no money. I had no family to speak of and recently become single after ending a long-term relationship. There was nowhere to go, nothing to do, and no one to talk to. I wasn't a fan of mutual aid meetings, the war stories bored me, and I knew there were plenty of people in the same boat. What I wanted was somewhere to hang out with my peers, have a little fun, and build my social network in a manner that felt safe. We thought that what was missing was a place to practice our social skills and get us through that dead time, that dangerous time in early recovery, when you've dealt with your substance use, but the rest of your life is a void, while you struggle to work out what it is you're going to do next. Our services are designed to help fill this gap, and we model all our activities around the five ways to wellbeing. So a few examples. Be active. We have a badminton club, table tennis competitions, a gym and swim club, running and cycling clubs give back, we have a big volunteer program where we train and support people to work and run in our services. Take notice, we have mindfulness classes, Tai Chi and yoga clubs. Keep learning. We have volunteer and service user training, creative workshops and a cooking club. And connect, probably the most important part of all, the social club itself, our recovery support groups and our recovery chairs. I imagine you want to know how a couple of ex-heroin users in treatment made all this happen. How I got to being in treatment back then in 2004 to talking to you right now. And how we ended up running one of the biggest lived experience recovery organizations in the country. First of all, we were very lucky. The timing was right. In 2005, service user involvement was big in London and there was money floating around. Secondly, I met the right commissioner. We initially started with £200 to buy some badminton equipment and hire a court each week. We set up a badminton club in our local service provider and took anyone who wanted to play out for a game once a week and then sat around in Portobello Road drinking coffee. I learned my first important lesson here. We've been offering to take people to play badminton for weeks before we funded and we were always asked the same question, is it free? No, we'd say two quid each, we have to divvy up or split the costs. And every time we got the same answer, now, nah, mate, I can't afford it. I remember the first week we had the funding, bowling into our treatment provider and saying, right, who's coming to play badminton? And everybody went, nah, not today. So one of the first things I learned is don't give up. Building things takes time. Very quickly, we came up with the idea of a Saturday club and asked our commissioner for some money and our local provider if we could use the premises at the weekend. We were asked to write a business plan. I tried to find a copy when I was putting this presentation together because it was terrible. We had no idea what a business plan was. And I have a memory that we were so paranoid in writing it, it even wrote down the cost of the batteries for a television remote control. It took a while for us to negotiate this. And this is where I learned my second lesson. It was a very bold piece of commissioning back then because our services were not for people who were abstinent. They were for anybody who wanted to come in. So we knew some people would still be using. We were told, okay, we'll fund it, but you've got to have a staff member present. We didn't like this idea, especially since we had to pay for it and it cost us about 4,000 quid a year. So we said, okay, they can come in, but they have to stay in the office. They cannot come downstairs and interfere. We'll call them if we need them. And we did that for a whole year. At the end of that year, we went back to our commissioner and the provider and said, look, we've never called you because we don't need you. Can you go away now? I think the most important thing about that original weekend service is that it was a collective effort. There was no such thing as a stupid idea and everyone was encouraged to contribute. I learned early on to try ideas that I wasn't sure of and that others thought were good. For example, in our services, before we start work, we always sit around in a circle and we do a check-in one at a time. Hello, this is how I feel. This is what my week has been like. And when we finish, and the service is closed and our clients have gone home, we do the same thing again. We check out, although we tend to talk more about work. It wasn't my idea and I wouldn't have done it, but it taught me to listen to the people around me. 
It took three years to build and develop that original weekend service. We worked out our ground rules step by step for ourselves. This was really important. We did not copy anyone else, but we played about trial and error. You should find somewhere in the pack that I sent through to expert citizens, a copy of our volunteer handbook. It took a couple of years for us to write that and put that together to create a framework, a set of rules, but we did it without referencing anywhere else. This is important because that is where originality comes from. So for example, in 2005, when we opened the original weekend service, there was an unwritten rule in London. You could not volunteer for any organization involved in drug and alcohol treatment or support until you had two years clean time up on the board. We decided that was dumb and we threw it straight out of the window. We said, no, 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 people need something to do. As long as they're not dependent, under the influence when they turn up for work and they're seeking help for their problems, we can, they can volunteer for us. I'm really proud of that. To the best of my knowledge, I think we were the first people to just tear that rule up and throw it out of the window. It made perfect sense. There were some big problems in building this. <clears throat> Working out what would cause us to exclude someone from the project was very, very difficult for us. For example, I remember a big debate with my colleagues, my peers and the volunteer team around what we would do if somebody came in and we caught them using drugs or carrying drugs on the premises. My initial instinct was that's it, you're barred, you're barred for life, you can never come back. Until a friend of mine pointed out, what about redemption? What about second chances? What if they're just having a really bad day and did something stupid? Again, I learned to listen to the people around me and say, you know what, that is a really fair point. We'll change the rules. Early on, we invited people to visit us, all sorts of people. Anyone who was interested in that original weekend service, we'd say, come down and have a look, come and join us, it will be great. Many years ago, I invited Mark Moody, long before he was the chief executive of the Live, to come and hang out for a weekend. I can never remember where I met him. It's unfortunate. I'll have to ask him one day. He came back the following day, donated the most massive Marshall bass amplifier, which we still got, and asked, how much would it cost me to buy one of these? This is really important. We'd spent three years building this weekend service and making it really, really good. And then we moved into stage two of our development. We cut a deal, we negotiated with what's now CGL, <coughs> and we sold them a weekend service in another part of London. I mention this because I think there are three stages to build on belief. The first stage took three or four years, which was creating the original weekend service. The next stage took five years which was selling that weekend service. I think CGL were the first people to buy it from us and everybody else sat back and thought, let's see if they can replicate it. Let's see if they can replicate it. And after five years, other people in London went, wow, they can. And then they wanted to buy it too. And we moved into stage three of our development. So building these things, creating these things is a long-term process. You have to take it slowly. I thought I'd spend a little time talking about what we've learned because I think learning is so important. Um, and I really want to encourage other people to have a go at building their own projects and building their own services. So when I sat and thought about this, I thought these are the things that I've learned. Number one, don't rush. It took 16 years from that first game of badminton to me talking to you now. Take it in small steps, do something, make sure it works, do the next thing. The next one was a battle for us, but we sorted it out. And it was this, don't get caught in the trap of trying to define recovery too closely. It doesn't matter whether someone chooses total abstinence, likes to take the odd drink socially, or prefers a medicalized model where they're scripted and stable. The only person that can define recovery is the person doing it. And I've seen many interesting lived experience recovery organizations fall apart because of their internal conflict over what recovery is supposed to be. At Bob, we support people to make their own choices and then achieve their goals, gently pointing out any flaws or risks in their reasoning. 
We may disagree with those choices sometimes, but then it is not our choice. For example, and for the life of me, I cannot understand why anybody would watch Strictly Come Dancing. But that doesn't mean if I was king of the country, I'd ban it from television, probably. Next point. And again, we learned this early and it really helped us. I think build on belief is amazing. I think what we do is unique and I think we do it exceptionally well. I think we're so cool we leave icy little footprints everywhere we walk. Telling people that doesn't get me very far. Data is money. It may be tedious to collect, boring to collate and a pain to keep updated, but you cannot get funded if you cannot evidence what you do. In our early days, we only collected names, postcodes, gender, which for us was basically male, female, other, and ethnicity, which was black, white, other. I mention this because a long time ago, I did a short presentation for a local authority on our work. And in the early days, and started giving them some of the statistics we got. And when I mentioned ethnicity, somebody turned around and said, how did you do that? Do what, I asked. Get that many people of BAME origin into your services. Well, we kind of opened the door and said, come in, was my response. What I didn't realize was we were 15 points above the national average. And that was a big incentive for the local authority to keep funding us. Because traditionally, along with women, people of BAME ethnicity were way, way underrepresented in the treatment system, which is mostly full of white men. So it was big learning. I've got to be honest, I messed the same presentation up a little bit later um, when I got tangled up in the difference between contacts and individuals. So when you're measuring this stuff, if Bob comes in on a Saturday, that's one individual, Bob, and one contact, because he came in on Saturday. <coughs> Bob comes in on Saturday and Sunday, that's one individual, Bob, but two contacts. This was explained to me in the course of my presentation. And I made the mistake of saying, oh, I get it. We've only got one client. They just come in and out an awful lot. Which resulted in the commissioner pointing a very, very stern finger at me and saying, never, never make that joke again. If you want to build something, you need to do the hard yards. A large part of my life these days is taking up looking at finance, contract monitoring reports, funding models and so on. I can't say it's the best part of my job. Over the years, I've seen many lived experience recovery organisations collapse through lack of money because no one was paying attention to the funding or fall apart because the people in charge felt that their job consisted of little more than standing up at as many conferences as possible and telling the world how wonderful they are and then sitting around with their feet on the table telling everybody else to do what to do. Leadership works through example. If you want your team to graft, you have to graft twice as hard and you have to be seen doing it. You share out the fun stuff with an even hand and never ask anyone to do anything you're not prepared to have a go at doing yourself. Double the amount of effort and triple the amount of time you thought it will take and you'll get there. Volunteering. We have a minimum of 130 volunteers at any one time, sometimes as many as 250. And I think th three, 4,000 people have volunteered for us over the past 15, 16 years. Volunteering should be fun. Volunteering should be supportive. People prepared to give up their time, energy, and passion to help you run a project are not cannon fodder. They should be loved and applauded, held up as good examples of citizenship. Therefore, you should always fit the task to the person and not the other way around. You will never get anywhere asking people to do something that you do not want to or cannot do. For example, many years ago, when I was running a service myself, I had a gentleman who really, really wanted to volunteer, but had a degree of learning difficulties, and we couldn't teach him boundaries. We couldn't teach him to keep his distance from people when he spoke to them, and we couldn't teach him that some conversations were not broken. Did we stop him volunteering? No, we did not. What we did was we had a long talk, and then we found a whole series of tasks a lot of them in the kitchen area where he could help and volunteer and be part of the team. We fitted the job to him, not him to the job. You should have award ceremonies, communal dinners. There should be positive feedback. 
company supervision. All these things are vital to running a successful volunteer team. And as I said, trust me, I know I've had thousands. What else have I learned? Failure is a part of success. It doesn't matter how good an idea is in theory, you need to road test it. We put together a suite of 45 online activities at high speed as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We're very proud of that. It was hard work. None of us had ever heard of Zoom <laughs> or Teams. So learning to use it was a bit of a trial. Some of the conversations we had in our recovery support group suggested that people were really beginning to struggle, especially during the second lockdown, and giving up on basic day-to-day -day activities. Things like looking after the house, going shopping, that sort of stuff. One of my colleagues had the idea of, let's do a let's clean together group so we can chat online with each other while we're doing the washing up and dusting the house and all the rest of that stuff. Sounded reasonable to me. So we gave it a go. Did it work? Did it help? There was no interest at all. Nada. Nothing. Zero. Were we downhearted? No, we weren't. We laughed about it and then we gave it the sack and went, right, what are we going to do in its place? Instead, we came up with a let's cook together group. Now that worked a treat. If you're building something, you cannot be right all the time. So don't worry about it. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Relationships with other organisations and partners need to be worked out. Being right all the time bores people. And after a while, it quickly annoys them. Constantly criticising the wider treatment system and telling them what they are doing wrong is a very fast way to get shut out of the loop. I heard this quote from a colleague of mine a couple of years ago, and I love this quote. And he said, if you're not around the table, then you're on the menu. Business requires flexibility. Partnership working requires flexibility. In the early days of the organisation, long before we became a registered charity, before we were built, I believe, I volunteered as a recovery worker for a year. Not because I wanted to become one, but because I wanted to understand what it was like on the other side of the fence. It was one of the smartest things I did. Learning about the difficulties encountered day to day in a big service provider like Change Grow Live or Turning Point made me better at my job because it taught me they too were trying to do the best they could. And we learned that we are far able, far better able to support our clients if we worked with our partners and recognised the challenges they faced as well as the challenges we faced rather than sitting back and enjoying ourselves by throwing rocks over the fence. To build your organisation and your ideas, you have to be able to negotiate. If you want something from your local service provider or commissioning team, whether it be money, access to premises, whatever, take the time to find out what they want. What do they need? How can you help support their work? How can you help meet their targets? We discovered in one of our bigger services that our local provider was having trouble getting people into treatment. It was the easiest thing in the world for us to help. Um, why don't you send a project worker down at the weekend? We've got 100 people coming in here on a Saturday. And you can just scoop them up and scoop the ones into treatment who need the support. It worked well for the clients, it worked well for us, and it worked well for the providers. I was asked to talk about our, our achievements. I don't really want to very much. To be honest, I am white, I am male, I am middle class. Doing that stuff makes me really uncomfortable. It feels like boasting and I hate that. What I will say is this. I think our greatest achievement is simply this. Build on belief proves that a group of people from dysfunctional background, coming out of decades of addiction, written off and unwanted by wider society can come together and build something that changes the treatment system, empowers and supports thousands of others and creates a community for some of the most disadvantaged people in society. I'll leave you with this quote from my PowerPoint. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. 
I believe with all my heart that if we can do it, you can do it too. You can get my contact details or speak to me later on over the day if you want to talk about this any further. I hope that was reasonable. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope it made sense. It's very difficult talking to a screen. I'd much rather be standing in front of you. But thank you for listening. It's much appreciated. <laughs>